A new book sheds light on the life of a great American president. That's next on City Corner. Potter and welcome to City Corner. Well, we all know about Abraham Lincoln, the president, but a new book, Young Lincoln, uh, gives us a look at a different side of that great American. And Jan Jacoby has written the book, Young Lincoln, and he joins us right now. Hi, Jan. Welcome to the show. Hi, Steve. Good to be here. You know, we've, uh, we all know Abraham Lincoln, the president, like I said, but your book looks at a whole different side of him. Right. Uh, Steve, I'm a middle school teacher. And my students uh, encouraged me to write this book because uh, there was no book that I could recommend to them. And so I was very interested in Lincoln's early years, uh, the years in Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois. And so uh, that's the uh, book. It takes Lincoln from maybe about age three or four to age 28. Well, since you're a teacher, you'll know better than I because it's been a long time since I studied Lincoln in grade school in high school, but I don't remember learning anything about him prior to maybe the, the presidential race, really. Isn't, well, that, isn't that mostly what's documented? Absolutely. Uh, this material that I based this on was uh, collected by William Herndon. William Herndon uh, was Lincoln's third uh, law partner, and, and when Lincoln died, uh, Herndon went around to people who had known Lincoln in Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, and collected massive amounts of recollections, reminiscences, letters, and that material is about like this. And then two scholars at uh, Knox College, Doug Wilson and Rod Davis, boiled it down to, a, to about a 700-page book that called Herndon's Informants, and that's the source material. Uh -huh. But has the average person read about Lincoln's early years anywhere? Only in the biographies. You know, if the biographies are six, 700 pages, the youth is like about 20 pages. So most of us have never read any of it. That's correct. We, we know the basic facts of the legend. Uh, so I guess you just explained how you gathered the information, but that must have been a lengthy process. It, it was. Uh, it took me seven years to write this book. Uh, and like many first uh, published writers, it was rejected by everybody in New York. It was actually rejected by Reedy Press a couple times. And I'll tell you what changed this book, and I can read you a little selection for that, is that uh, it was initially in third person. And as a writer, narr uh, uh, the narrative turned first person. Abraham Lincoln tells his story himself. See, I don't know how you think you could, do, you could do that, because you have to be pretty confident, right, to write, a, write in first person about Abraham Lincoln at a time when hardly any of his life was documented. What made you think you could do that? Uh, excellent question. I, you know, it's one of those things that I just tried. And in trying, uh, it, it fell into place. Uh, David McCulloch, who is one of my heroes, says that when you work with material like this, you have to let it marinate. And I think that I'd been reading about Lincoln since I first moved, uh, came to St. Louis in 1982. You're from New York originally. Right. And so uh, really, I realized I was an hour and a half from the Lincoln sites. And I went up there and got so interested, I read everything I could about Lincoln. And that material marinated enough for when it came time to switch this narrative uh, that I, I was able to do it. It's interesting. You said uh, your book was rejected by Reedy Press, but that's who ended up publishing it. That's right. Oh, and, and they have very high standards. Uh, Josh Stevens said uh, to me, you're a teacher. You're not a writer. <laughs> was that a compliment? <laughs> Well, uh, I, what I do is, I, when I give my thanks to him, I say, Josh is unvarnished criticisms. <laughs> so, you know, writers need to hear that. Yeah. Also, uh, the reason this book exists is I had a wonderful young, uh, young adult editor in Chicago, Kathleen Dragan. And Kathleen uh, really pulled that book into, into shape. Well, your book is Young Lincoln, and I want you to talk a little bit about the preface that you wrote. And I'm just going to read the first sentence, and I want you to, to respond to that. The very first thing you say is, I am an unlikely fellow. What do you mean? No one would have thought I'd end up president. I didn't think so myself. When my friends first approached me and said I should run, I said, just think of such a sucker as me as president. Uh, when he finishes the preface, he writes, 
the most I'd say for myself is that I became an instrument of purpose. Whether I'd been that all my life, I can't say. I sure never saw myself that way, and neither did anyone else. Some of those people in Salem would have said, he just loafs around reading his books all day. Ain't no good at coming to him. All I knew was I didn't want to be a farmer. Which his dad was. Exactly. He was an unlikely president, wasn't he? If we were living back in the time when he ran, he'd be like some unusual off-the-wall candidate that might run today. I mean, we would have put him in that category? Uh, it's hard to say. I, I think what he was able to do was uh, he uh, received the nomination of a major party. Uh, the Whig Party had become the Republican Party, the Free Soil Party. And I do think that uh, the, the, there are several things. One is the convention was held in Chicago, and his handlers, we would call them, Judge David Davis and the other men who knew Lincoln so well, uh, really behind the scenes uh, made his nomination possible. And I think they knew that there was the character in that man that could take us through the Civil War. We have an image I want to share with our uh, viewers right now, Jan, and I'd like you to look at it. We're talking with Jan Jacoby, who's written the novel Young Lincoln. What's this? This is a painting by Eastman Johnson. It's a very famous painting of Lincoln reading by the fireplace. <clears throat> and this is emphasized in the book. Uh, Lincoln became Lincoln because of one simple thing, reading. He read and read and read, and that made, ultimately he read law books, and that uh, helped him to become a lawyer. He was a brilliant, he was actually a genius, there's no doubt about that. And so this Eastman Johnson shows you when uh, his mother died, and then uh, about a year and a half later, his stepmother came into his life. She brought him books, and he read them, uh, not unlike the image there. You know, Jan, you, talk, you made a big point that Lincoln was a reader and so forth. And so I have to wonder, as a teacher in these ages, are you concerned about the lack of reading young people do? Because people in the know seem to think that uh, a lot of young people don't read enough. Uh, deeply concerned, Steve. I, I think reading is a way of thinking. It's a way of learning. And if you don't uh, have that, it, it, it's real it's scary to me. I think also reading is something you do alone, and it's something you uh, really relate to another person or the author uh, in that uh, relationship is what happens when you read a book. Mm -hmm. and, and children now, because they're so stimulated by visual uh, images, uh, don't, don't really have the, uh, the chutzpah to read a book. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that part of the reason that you decided to uh, sort of uh, write this book, sort of directed to a young reader and not an adult reader? Yes, uh, and again, it, Again, the story of it is that my students would come up and say, can you recommend a book on Lincoln? And I would say, well, there really isn't one for middle school. And they were the ones who said you should write it. And so, in fact, the book is dedicated to my students, past and present. Mm -hmm. And so, so this was written for them. And uh, first uh, kind of field tests with students at my school is they, they seem to like it. Mm -hmm. um, it's written in the first person, as you say. What did you learn? Was there any? You've studied Lincoln a long time, so during this process, was there anything that you didn't know about that you learned? I don't think I knew how deeply he'd been depressed, and and how he had to. Uh, you know, we often think the the uh, scholars say there were two periods in his life, which was after Ann Rutledge died and after he uh, broke his engagement to Mary Todd. He went into deep depressions, they call it. But there was sort of mild and medium level depression throughout his life. And I, that surprised me a bit. Even when he was president? Absolutely. Uh-huh. Hmm. Uh, how does the book start? How early does it start? Oh, it starts uh, when they're in uh, Kentucky. The, the opening sequence is a story that his uh, father's father, Lincoln's grandfather, told of how his father was out in the cornfield one day at the age of six or seven planting corn with a family and his father was shot right in front of him by an Indian. Just total, and the brains were out on the corn. The, absolutely, and, and his father saw that. And his, uh, he was saved by an older brother who, two of them, one ran to get help, the other one ran back to the cabin, pulled out the family uh, musket 
and uh, actually shot this Indian who was ready to take uh, Lincoln's father, uh, kidnap him. Wow. Uh, when I was in college, uh, my family moved to Bardstown, Kentucky, which is south of Louisville, and Lincoln's birthplace was, I want to say, a 20-minute drive, wet, ho not Hodgensville, is that the right? Yeah, is it? Hodgensville. Yep. And I think they have a cabin there, they say, could have been Lincoln's birthplace. It's like the cross in which Jesus was crucified. <laughs> <laughs> there are relics all over churches in, uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, it, it is, it's in a very nice setting, and uh, if nothing else, it really replicates the, that, that cabin. So, but he didn't live there very long. No, uh, that's uh, seven years. And then they moved to Indiana. They go to Indiana. So is that primarily where he grew up? It, pretty much. Uh, he, uh, yes, that, that is, uh, I think he li they leave Indiana when he's about, uh, I think, 19 or 20. Okay, so in Hodgensville and Indiana in those early years, his dad was a farmer, uh, but not some successful rich farmer, right? Heavens no. No, he actually uh, made furniture. He was a cabinet maker and a furniture uh, made, made his own furniture salesman, but but it's basically a farmer. Subsistence farming is what they all did. And is any of that furniture still around? Uh, yes, yes, it is, and it, it's not half bad. <laughs> I bet it sells for a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, I would think. I think it's in museums. <laughs> what, well, what was his life like um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis when he was there in Hodgensville in Indiana? I mean, did he work eight hours out in the field every day, or what was his life like? Well, uh, it was. Uh, uh, first of all, he has a sister. Uh, there was a, a sibling who died after about three or four days and, ch and ch uh, shortly after he was born. Uh, I think it was kind of uh, palling around with a friend he had, uh, Austin uh, Gallagher was one, and, and learning at the beginnings of the farming. His father had him out there. In fact, he plants little corn seeds. It's a wonderful little story about, uh, and then uh, the, the, he plants pumpkin seeds. He's doing his little hills, and the father's planting corn seeds. And then that night, this huge torrent of water rushes through, and, and, and Lincoln comes the next day and says, what happened to my seeds? <laughs> <laughs> and Thomas said, don't worry. We can do it again. <laughs> it was very sweet. Do you know, he didn't want to be a farmer. Was that something he always that sentence doesn't make sense. Was that something he always didn't want to be? <laughs> uh, yes. I, I, well, I think what happens is, first of all, you have uh, a mind that is extraordinary. Going back to the young reader. That's it. And, and I think that that's starting to open up a world for him. And, he, and then the next thing that's happening is he's, which is not unlike the, the frontier, is he's doing a lot of work for his father, and then he's working on farms of neighbors, and his father gets all that money. He actually takes a trip down to New Orleans, uh, and they take a flat boat down and uh, sell uh, crops uh, in New Orleans, sell the flat boat itself. And when he comes back up, he, he, his father asks for the money. Mm -hmm. well, where, where's the money, bud? Uh, and, and I think that graded on him a little bit. Right. Uh, some people say, I, you know, I was a slave in the free country. Uh, as a t That's actually in the book there. And I think that's not an unreasonable way of looking at it. Hmm. Young Lincoln is the book. Jan Jacoby is the author. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back to talk about the young years of Abraham Lincoln right after this. plan today when they test you stand firm and move only when you hear the seatbelt click that says they're buckled in for the drive never give up till they buckle up Parking over tall, dry grass can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. I'm Steve Potter. Welcome back to City Corner. And my guest today is Jan Jacoby. He's written this new book, Young Lincoln, 
which is written in the first person and tells the story of Abraham Lincoln's early years uh, from up to what, a teenager? Uh, no, this book, Steve, goes through the end of the New Salem period, which is, uh, he's 28. About two-thirds of that book is New Salem, and he's there from 22 to 28. Jan, you mentioned uh, in the first segment about you being a teacher, and you moved here from New York, but you've been here a long time. So just briefly, can you give me your little resume about what you've done here in St. Louis? Sure. Uh, well, I actually, in the middle of all the, I, this year coming up is my 46th consecutive year as a middle school teacher. Wow. But in the middle of that, for 30 years, I was a middle school principal. And I came to St. Louis Country Day School to be uh, head of the 5th, 6th, 7th grade. And then when they merged uh, MICDS, I was uh, the head of the middle school there for 16 years. So, uh, And uh, since then, uh, I, when I uh, stepped down and left uh, MICDS, uh, Little St. Michael School, which is with our church, the Church of St. Michael and St. George uh, in Clayton, invited me to be their 7th and 8th grade humanities teacher. And my wife teaches there too. We walk to work. Oh wow! <laughs> and it's uh, yeah, it's, it's I love it. I and I'm I signed on for another year and, and uh, looking forward to it. Are you ever going to retire? <laughs> well, it, actually, uh, there could be a sequel to this book, uh, and at some point, uh, the Reedy Press is pleased with the with the, how we're doing. And uh, when they give me the green light, I, I think that might be time for me to write. You mean would it pick up? When this, where this one leaves off? Yes, it and it would be a little bit tougher. It's called Lincoln in Springfield. And that would take the middle age, uh, which would be, say, when he's 28 uh, until, uh, excuse me, 1858, when he's, uh, 1860. When Any he's, signs of depression back then that we know about, or was that later in life? Oh, uh, you no, know, it's all the way through. Really, the even whole, in the young years? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, certainly the young years, uh, the very youngest. I, I, I have a scene there where I picture him seeing his mother kind of sad and, and depressed, and he says to himself, uh, you know, I sometimes feel that way myself. Now, interestingly enough, for young people who might feel that way, what does he do? He takes a walk and walks through the woods. He's alone, and as he walks through the woods, just the birds and the little creek that he puts his toes in. In fact, when he uh, finishes that, uh, he says to himself, you know, I'm kind of in that place like the, this place is like that garden in the Bible. Uh, now religion in Lincoln's a tougher subject, but, but he's very biblical in the, in the well, fact that. I can relate with, I don't really suffer from depression, but I get down like anybody. And when I do, I go for a walk and I go to the park and it makes all the difference. That's what it did for him. Yeah. I'm convinced. Let's uh, look at another image that we have to share with our viewers and explain what that is. Uh, this is young Lincoln uh, doing a farm chore, so to speak. There's a wonderful story of him with an ax uh, that, well, this is when he was president, and he would uh, often go to the uh, soldiers out and visit the Civil War uh, soldiers, and they had a game that they would hold out an ax and they would see how long one of them could hold this thing. It's a heavy weight, uh -huh. like, like this. And Abraham Lincoln said at some point, oh, give it to me. And he, and he, defe and he held it out longer than any of them could. Huh. He was, and in fact, sadly, when he uh, was uh, assassinated and they took his body over to the Peterson house and had to uh, take off his shirt, he had a physique like a very young man. I mean, that, all that came from that. Okay, here's a question out of the blue. How tall are you? Six foot three. How tall is Lincoln? Six foot four. <laughs> you know why I'm asking. <laughs> we almost met once. That's correct. It's a, it's a great story. Uh, my wife, for my 50th birthday, uh, had us go in period dress. She was Mary Lincoln, I was Abraham Lincoln, over to the reenactment of the seventh uh, Lincoln Douglas debates in Alton in October. Uh, I'm, not, not, I'm not sure, it was about 20, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so as we went over there, we, sit, we were able, because we're in period dress, to sit in the first two Because we, this was nationally televised on C-SPAN, so there were the people portraying Lincoln and so forth on stage, and then people like you that were in costume, there was a big crowd, but the people in costume could be up front because they'd be caught on camera. Exactly right. And so it turns out, Steve, that you were the moderator. Uh, and I was telling you earlier that uh, at that day, uh, I, now that go, went on for three, three hours because the first speech is an hour. Uh, that was by uh, Douglas. And then Lincoln had, he spoke for an hour and a half. And then Douglas finished for a half an hour. That's three hours of speaking. 
And, I, and I, my wife and I were entranced. You almost hold, you're, you're, you're hanging on every word. First of all, they're so articulate. And secondly, they're debating a very, very important subject in our history. Uh, I think people should, you know, you can Google it and look it up. If you do Lincoln-Douglas debate, Alton, Illinois, C-SPAN, it'll come up. So you can watch it at home if you want to. I played uh, Judge Billings, who was, a, who was a real person, the real moderator. And I was the one that got up first. Uh, the, it was the real mayor of Alton who played the mayor of Alton, then spoke. Then I got up, made a speech, and I introduced Douglas, sat there. Then I introduced Lincoln, sat there, and I th think I did something at the end. But you probably wouldn't recognize me because uh, I had slick, uh, slicked back brown hair and a big mustache. <laughs> well, I have, to, I have to see that again. We almost met that day. Yeah. Let's take a look at another image. That one we just saw. So we'll go to the next one. This is Lincoln reading again. There we uh, go. Yeah, all right, now on this one, uh, I think what I really like about this is the sense of uh, being uh, self-reliant, being uh, growing into himself uh, as a as a young man. Uh, when I first started thinking about Lincoln, what really the question that really caught me was: Here he uh, let's uh, transpose him to being president. He's been elected president. He in that time period. He has no close friend in Washington. His dearest friend, Joshua Speed, is back in Kentucky, and they've split over slavery. He has no colleague with whom he can share because the President of the United States says one thing to somebody, and bam, it's out all over the place. And his wife, who at first uh, had been uh, having some difficulties when Willie Lincoln dies, she's gone. And so he has, Mary has become a burden. Here's a man who for four years carries all that stress uh, of the Civil War on his back, all that blood, all those inept generals, all those decisions, and he can't talk to a single person about it. That's the ultimate loneliness to me. That image that you have of Lincoln there shows him beginning to develop the seeds of a young man who can uh, be comfortable by and in himself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what, and so what I realized almost subconsciously in this book is I tracked back and the Lincoln in that book is the Lincoln who became that leader who could, uh, through self-reliance, could take us through the Civil War. Was I wrong? The image I just said we looked at, had we not seen that? The one I skipped over? Do you remember? Oh, that, that was another one of him reading. But we hadn't seen it. No, no I don't think so. Okay, maybe we go back to that. Okay, sure. I apologize to all no, the people. No, no, no problem. There we yeah. go. Oh, sure, that's another one of Lincoln reading. And, and again, I think that uh, there again, he is by himself. He's, uh, and I'm not, Lincoln was not a loner. He was not uh, someone who kept uh, solely to himself. He was one of the boys. Really, see, because my image, and I, I wouldn't know, the, he was not one of the popular kids. It's just how I perceive him. Uh, that's a little tougher. Uh, he certainly could be one of the boys, and he had a, uh, he was, uh, loved telling stories, of course, and, and entertaining people. So, uh, but again, the, the boys were, in those days, uh, you know, those kind of neighborhoods, and yeah, he had friends, because he, he's not in school only for one year out of his life. So there's not much schoolyard stuff. Do we know, and I shouldn't even go there, do we know much about his love life? Well, uh, yes. In fact, uh, there he, uh, the Ann Rutledge story, which a lot of people think is just simply uh, well, the scholars in the early part of the 20th century dismissed. In the second, uh, latter years of the 20th century, there are people who brought it back in. The, the evidence is that after Ann Rutledge died, he was deeply depressed. Maybe you should explain who she was. Right. Uh, in New Salem, she was the daughter, very attractive uh, young woman who was the daughter of the owner of the tavern. And uh, she was engaged to uh, a very successful merchant who actually left her and went back east to bring his family to New Salem. And he appeared that he was never going to return. So she was kind of engaged, yet this, and, and then Lincoln and Ann Rutledge became friends. And toward the end of uh, their relationship, uh, one of her, her brothers says, in fact, she was engaged to Lincoln. Hmm. And then, uh, sadly, what happens is uh, that a fever sweeps through uh, New Salem, 
and uh, actually she's up a little bit further north at Sand Ridge, her, the family farm, and she dies of this uh, frontier fever. Hmm. Uh, so it, it's, it's a very sad story. But, uh, however, in general, many of the scholars feel that he was pretty awkward around young women. Mm -hmm. and some of the He's not the only guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and some of the reminiscences from the Herndon material portray him as being awkward. You know, uh, Josh, Josh Stevens at Reedy Press, I know he likes your work and everything since they published your book, but I heard a rumor that uh, they actually cut a certain chapter or part of your book out, so I just want the inside story just between us. <laughs> between us. Well, Steve, there, there is a, a story that Josh did not want in there, it, uh, I will uh, say that it, it's frontier humor. Uh, it's pretty simple, is that uh, Lincoln and his friend Austin were out uh, kind of chasing squirrels when they were about, I think about seven or eight years old, seven, for six or seven. Uh, and so they, they were climbing trees. And so they had little frontier hats. And so these frontier hats were uh, lying on the ground. And those days, that what they were wearing were just little shifts. So, so Lincoln actually climbs up in the thing and sees Austin's hat down there and, as he said, dropped a load down <laughs> in Austin's hat. Well, when he gets down there, Austin is rolling over uh, and laughing his head off. And so Lincoln, well, what's so funny? And he says, you know what? While you're up there, I switched the hats. <laughs> I don't know why that's not in your book. <laughs> I'll talk to Josh about that later. <laughs> uh, listen, uh, I want to ask you something before you go, though. This has nothing to do with Lincoln. I bet Lincoln would have been a golfer if he was alive today. But, uh, you know, there's a big PGA thing going on in St. Louis, and you're part of it. I am a marshal. Yeah, I'll be on the first hole. At, at Belle Reve. At, at Belle Reve, right. And, uh, no, I don't think Lincoln would have played golf. I'll tell you a little thing about Lincoln, though. He would have loved technology. He was very interested in the latest inventions. In fact, as president, he had a patent himself. So he, if, he would have been into technology. But if I'd seen one of those old paintings with him on a mobile device or something, I just would scream. <laughs> hey, Jan Jacoby, <laughs> Young Lincoln is the book. Uh, go to readypress.com, available in a lot of bookstores, right? Right. I should mention, uh, if I'm allowed to, subterranean books. They've been very uh, kind. And Novel Neighbor, those are independent bookstores, Main Street, very books good. in Chicago. Well, we'll keep our ears open for the sequel. Thank you, Jan oh, Jacoby. Good. And thank you for watching. Join us next time on City Corner. Young Lincoln.